Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm Bob the Booker and today I wanted to talk about um, a Booker Prize icon and a, a brilliant author in his own right, William Trevor. Uh, now I'll be focusing a little bit more on his books that were shortlisted for the Booker Prize, um, but um, it's worth sort of noting obviously he has a far bigger career than <laughs> just that. Um, that is maybe just the bit that I'm a little bit more focused on. Um, however, um, he is a writer who I've sort of discovered because of the Booker Prize and have promptly fallen kind of in love with. Um, he also, on a fun side point, won an award called the Bob Hughes Lifetime Achievement Award. And Bob Hughes being my name, that also makes me quite happy. Uh, that, that is an award for, for Irish writers. Um, so alas, it'll never, there'll never be a case, even if I got published, where Bob Hughes uh, could win the Bob Hughes Award, unfortunately, um, as much as I would love that to happen. Anyway, uh, all of this aside, uh, William Trevor uh, was an Irish author who, um, has sort of just you know he passed away in a, a few years back but has just such an incredible body of work behind him um, and i really wanted to zoom into the four uh, books that he was shortlisted for for the Booker Prize, um, but there is also um, one other book that he was long listed for in 2009 uh, called Love and Summer, uh, which I've not yet read, but I really want to check out um, because, in, you know, reading all the shortlists of the Booker Prize is enough uh, and going through all the long lists as well is something that I may do after I finish with all the shortlists. Let's see. Um, but that said, 2009 was one of the first years where the long list was really public. So um, he may have also been, you know, in, in contention or kind of thought of uh, in, in other years as well. But let's start off with one of the absolute first Booker Prizes. This is you know, only the second year it happened in 1970. Um, and he uh, released the book uh, Mrs. Eckdorf in O'Neill's Hotel, which is a bit of a mouthful of a book. Um, and I just finished it today. Um, so I feel like I've read them pretty much in the wrong order. But anyway, um, this book is all about um, this woman, Mrs. Eckdorf, who, Lucy e Eckdorf, who um, has basically, we, we, we meet her first on a plane as she is talking the ear off this man. <laughs> and she is sort of babbling and and you, you know, some, some, sometimes you might meet kind of the odd stranger or you might have a friend in your kind of circle who just talks and um, seemingly goes off on their own little tangents. I, I mean, I'm not fully this person in my friendship group, I don't think. Um, I'm definitely talkative. But, uh, you know, Mrs. Ektorf, it starts in quite a funny way because she, she sort of starts talking about something. Her plane, the, the guy sat next to her on the plane is clearly like okay, I'm going to go and sleep now. And she's like, and then the, the the priest told me this and blah, blah, blah. And she just, it's this kind of monologue and it's intense. And what's really interesting, I think, about this book is then how that nuance is later added. Um, and this is something that I've really enjoyed over the four books I've read of William Trevor. Um, and I should note, I don't think I mentioned at the beginning, I'm sort of doing this at this exact time uh, because his birthday is about to come up. And so by the time this this goes out, uh, it'll be, I think, a day before his, his birthday um, on the sort of 23rd of May. Um, so... Yes, really, uh, sorry, 24th of May. Um, and he is a super interesting um, author because of how he manages to handle this nuance. So you've got this woman who, you know, could be written off at the beginning of this book as being somewhat um, unstable or kind of a bit too much. And, you know, we still see traces of that during the book. But essentially what it does with that is explores ideas around religion. Um, you know, Mrs. Ektorf arrives at this hotel and she wants to... Um, to try and buy it at one point. She's a photographer. She's really fascinated by the fact that people have uh, died or that there have been this, there's this kind of tragic history around the hotel. And we, we're kind of introduced to this really interesting idea early on that her kind of garrulousness and her photography are somewhat connected. There's a kind of nosiness almost to both aspects that she really wants to get in inside every single part of someone's life and find out the stories and, and all of this kind of stuff. And so as a result, her wanting to buy the hotel um, or kind of it being believed that she does, it's kind of a, there's, there are sort of quite a few miscommunications throughout. Uh, it becomes quite funny and quite dark and quite interesting. Um, and then explores this idea around religion because she kind of goes to this priest and again talks his ear off in confessions. Um, and she kind of keeps on exploring these ideas around what it means for her to be to be alive, to be human. Um, and it's just such an interesting book. Um, I really want to reread it because I don't think my brain was fully with it when I started it. Um, and so I do feel like I've maybe only really gotten sort of 60 to 70 percent of it. I, I really enjoyed 
that but I, I think I, a, a rereading would give me a lot more of the love of the nuance of the language um, because that's definitely something I found with some of the other books that I'll be talking about. And then so fast forward six years later to 1976, um, William Trevor gets shortlisted again for The Children of Dinmouth, um, which is such an interesting book. So at the heart of it, we have this uh, character, this young sort of teenage boy, um, and we're kind of meant to see him as a bit of an outcast quite early on. And his sense of being an outcast, it's interesting, I think, in kind of modern day readings of it. I um, sort of saw quite a few people mentioning this on things like on Goodreads and, and sort of other reviews as well. In sort of modern day, with a modern day lens, I guess, we would probably look at the central character in this book as being sort of somewhere on the autism spectrum um, because of just the way he sort of painted as being essentially a bit of an outsider within this sort of coastal community. Um, uh, that's gearing up for this big fair. He's sort of seen as he doesn't quite get some of the nuances of social convention. Um, he doesn't quite grasp um, some of the other rules. And actually there's an interesting parallel here with Mrs. Eckdorf and, and this book in that both of these characters at the beginning are sort of seen as too much. Um, you know, they are these outsider characters that nobody can really stand in some ways, but actually because of their outsider status, they expose everybody for what they are um, in a really real and very visceral and actually quite scary way in some ways. So for Mrs. Eckdorf, it's taking loads of pictures that are quite exposing and bring out stories that people were trying to keep hidden. Uh, in, uh, in The Children of Dinmouth, the main character is, um, he sort of basically, he, he wants to gear up for this talent show in this sort of big festival that takes place once a year um, at, in this seaside town in Dinmouth. And he is, um, he is so desperate to win with a kind of comedy show. And so sort of right at the beginning, we get him telling these jokes that don't land and he'll be amongst people in a sort of social setting they're already clearly annoyed that he's not leaving their house, <laughs> like he's just there. And then he tells more and more of these uh, jokes, which are very kind of dad jokes. Um, and it's interesting because at the beginning he is sort of shunned. Um, and then he has this moment where he, um, in sort of a sort of school setting, I think it was, sort of uh, dresses in sort of this Elizabethan wig and gown and puts on this sort of high pitched voice. And suddenly his jokes become funny to everybody. And so he's kind of, blown his mind is blown by this because he doesn't really understand that now now people are finding him funny and previously people didn't necessarily seem to do so um and so he starts putting on this high-pitched voice but in in doing so he is also going around everybody's houses trying to get various things that he needs or that he thinks he needs for his performance so he wants curtains um he wants a specific he wants i think a van that he's going to sort of appear out of um he wants all these little things and he knows everybody in the village and all the town and and how he's going to get them but in going to people's houses to find all of these materials he basically accidentally exposes things uh that that, you know, people want to keep hidden. So uh, there's a, a brother and sister who he sort of befriends for a bit. And then he basically starts finding out stories about um, their family and about their parents, um, which kind of shocks the kids and shocks kind of the family, you know. And he accidentally introduces these things in quite a cold way because he sort of doesn't get the social conventions of everybody around him. So he slowly in kind of gathering these things finds out other bits, you know, he finds out that one of the men in the town um, is I mean, it's kind of hinted that he, well, more than hinted really, but that he's sort of having affairs with with young men and often boys, um, you know, under the age, uh, un underage boys. Um, and that kind of comes out. And that same man also sort of gets this character drunk. Um, and so lots of things are kind of coming up where you're like, oh, this is quite uncomfortable. And it all, I mean, I love when books do this anyway, kind of, it reminded me a lot of actually of um, An Inspector Calls. Um, I think both of these books do, both Mrs. Eckdorf and Children of Dinmouth um, do something that, the, that uh, An Inspector Calls by J.B. Priestley does so well, um, which is this idea of an outside character coming in and basically being a mirror to everybody else. Because by kind of coming in, he changes the balance, secrets become unearthed, and people kind of have to look at really who they are. Um, and so it all kind of leads up to this idea of kind of him gearing up for this big comedy performance that's going to happen. And it's, but then it kind of, it, 
it kind of goes away from that. You suddenly realise there's so, so much more happening in this town. And he almost single-handedly seems to have destroyed everybody. But then you think, actually, he's not destroyed anyone. He has merely held a mirror up to things that people have done um, and that things, are pe things that people have tried to keep hidden. And it's so, so interesting for that reason. Next, fast forward 15 years and we get to 1991 um, and this uh, saw William Trevor get his third shortlisting and this time for reading Turgenev. Uh, Turgenev? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Who knows? And it's weird actually because this novella, um, it's sort of, yeah, it's, an, it, it, it's listed in as, a, as a novella and was originally published as a set of two novellas called Two Lives. Um, and reading Turgenev um, I thought was so beautiful and um, it's strange because so much seems to happen for what is essentially, yeah, it is a novella. Um, so this is all around this idea of this woman who um, in her, um, in her sort of younger years, there is this sort of man who she feels like she's in love with, um, who's her cousin actually, I think. And um, so she basically is married quite young. Um, and there's this sort of moment where she, her cousin, I think essentially says that he's always loved her and she sort of starts to feel some of those, those feelings too, but kind of buries them a bit because she's married and because, um, of just her life circumstances. And we then sort of fast forward a little bit through her life and there then suddenly becomes this really poignant and beautiful moment, um, where she, uh, basically Robert, Robert, the, the the cousin, I think it was Robert, yeah, um, dies and she um, suddenly her mental health just collapses because she doesn't sort of realise, she hadn't really realised before how much she's been sort of holding on. She's got this marriage um, and they've never consummated it um, and it's kind of hinted sort of throughout, partly it's him, um, either sort of him not being able to do it um, or and, and kind of partly her that she sort of doesn't want it and she's almost quite childlike throughout this whole book it's almost like she at the heart of it has just been um, sort of suspended in her sort of childhood or sort of early teens and she's never quite progressed and so there's this really beautiful look at how she is later in life um, and what's happened is she has sort of buried this for so so long that it starts manifesting in quite sort of to others sort of quite strange behaviors so she goes and lives up in this attic in this house um and she slowly starts buying all of these things that remind her of her dead cousin and sort of first love um and so that involves um for example buying loads of his old furniture and actually stealing money from her husband to be able to do this um buying lots of little uh, toy soldiers uh, because he sort of died in, in war and sort of just really decorating this whole attic space with things that remind her of him in a sort of an attempt to hold a shrine to him to kind of keep him alive that little bit longer but obviously everybody around her is just like what is going on with this woman she is crazy she's lost it um you know the, the sisters of, of her husband are telling him to leave her um because he's dragging her down but it's so much more complicated than that because he sort of feels some sort of guilt and some sort of sense of responsibility around his wife uh but also he sees himself as having failed because they never consummated the marriage and there's this sort of underlying notion there that um he is worried that by distancing himself from her and them you know often sleeping in different beds that he has created this horrible situation um and also you know there's this whole thing about her wanting a whole discussion around her wanting to have a child now nobody else knows that their marriage was never consummated so they're always saying oh you know why is she acting like this she uh you know clearly um clearly it's just because she could never have a child and the husband remains incredibly quiet because they never consummated their marriage and he sees that again as his fault so he sort of starts wondering well if i'd gotten her pregnant would everything have been different and it, it's just so deep and in depth for what is a novella uh, i was staggered by the beauty of this book um something that william trevor does exceptionally well in my opinion is well, i mean apart from just the writing being impeccable he 
is able to convey so, so much in so few words. And I was taking pictures and screenshots all the way through um, his four books. And um, particularly in uh, reading, reading Turgenev, um, there is this gorgeous moment where um, a character dies and it's done, we're told this in about a sentence and it's right at the end of a chapter and it it's weird it doesn't feel like a cliffhanger or like a big dramatic moment in some ways and you almost need to reread that sentence several times just to confirm in your own head that somebody has died but it's done you know in a sort of i i won't try and imitate him but it'll be something along the lines of you know she went up to sleep um for the last time uh, you know um and and did this for the last time and it's just it, it in the kind of rhythm of the book it could almost be looked past but it's so gorgeously done um and again i just from these four books william trevor just has such a beautiful insight into people's minds that we see characters who are so divorced from reality in what what in in whatever way or so different from the rest of society and yet we follow them because they are there's something so human about their distance um, and there's something so human about their inability to bond with other humans and it's so gripping and and touching and it's just gorgeous um you, you may notice from all of this that i am a little bit in love with these books um and i think especially these last two that i'm going to be talking about so reading turgenev and the next one i just thought were stunning um i devoured them and wanted more and wanted to go back and reread them because they they were just such masterful looks at the human condition um and they're both they're, they're tragic whilst being really warm um and they're really funny but with also dealing with incredibly serious subject matter and i it's nothing like anything i've read in a long long time and then finally he uh was shortlisted for a fourth time um and it was to be his last time unfortunately and then he was longlisted uh, a bit after but in 2002 the story of lucy galt um galt i don't exactly know how to pronounce it i'm gonna go with galt um and this again uh, mind-blowing i had no idea what to expect from this um i'd heard people kind of talking about this especially because it's a bit more recent um in terms of you know his books um and it was in a book a shortlist uh, of uh, alongside you know the life of pi which happens to be a book i adore and so i was really intrigued to kind of see what it was about and it's weird because on the surface parts of this should you know it, this book made me shrug off some of my sometimes frustration about war and world war ii and world war one being used in books as a kind of um, plot device because sometimes I've read it and it's been done really lazily as in it's just used to add drama um, in this book it felt incredibly purposeful um, which I was very very grateful for so um, Lucy Galt at a young age um, goes out into the water um, and there's this kind of thing she's kind of got quite an odd relationship in some ways with her parents but um, you know they're in this small village and she goes out to the water they don't, aren't really paying much attention to her and she um sort of essentially falls over and breaks her um i think it's her ankle or her leg in some way um but in in this all happening there's also this dog and and whatever but her dress is left behind and so her parents um who were already kind of thinking about moving and that had kind of been a big Thing. they'd mentioned to their to, to Lucy that they were thinking about moving and she reacted quite badly so her going out to the sea was her kind of running away to have a sort of last little night of freedom or, or what have you as a child um you know she's very young I think at this point um and so she runs out to sea to kind of have this little last moment with the dog and all that's then found uh sort of that evening and you know people are panicking and looking around is her dress um, the dog is nowhere to be seen neither is is lucy um and so we kind of get this real feeling of you know that everybody around thinks she's died um and the parents are tired of uh, they kind of can't process this and so they leave um they move away they carry on their plan to move as they were they were thinking and they go around europe particularly sort of around switzerland and italy 
uh, which is relevant for later, um, uh, and particularly Italy. And so they are, they go off to Italy assuming that their daughter has just died and they, they don't talk about it, they can't process the grief of it, but slowly but surely they come to settle and feel quite happy in their life in Italy. Um, and they suddenly warm up a bit, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily process it, but they, they feel like full humans. And in the meantime, we learn that Lucy, as you'd imagine, given that her name is, you know, in the title of the book, the, the story of Lucy Galt, we are probably expecting that she has a bit more life in her. And indeed she does. So what happens is Lucy is then found a sort of day or two later. Um, she'd sort of somehow escaped all of this. And so she's basically this young child running around naked. Um, and she's been sort of fending for herself in the woods for a few days. And um, it's this kind of really interesting thing because she's almost, she's not feral by that point, but it's sort of almost treated as if she is. And so everybody in the village sort of rallies around to look after her. Their old house, you know, Lucy's old house is still there. And, you know, we're, we're told that she's been sort of surviving on sugar sandwiches, um, as in literally just sort of bread and butter with, well, maybe not even butter, but with just sugar in the middle. And so she's a bit mal malnourished, but the, the village all kind of, you know, bandies together to look after her. And it's then obviously really interesting because all the village want to let the parents know that she is safe. And so they try to reach out to them, but because this, you know, the, these parents are moving fairly regularly across different parts of Italy, they keep on missing her. And, uh, you know, they, they keep on missing the letters rather. Um, and they, we kind of, uh, it, uh, sort of, at this point in the book, it switches to a chapter each side. Um, and normally the chapters of the parents are incredibly short, normally about one or two pages. Um, often them just sort of looking into each other's eyes and feeling a sense of calm um, and thinking about writing home, but they never do. Meanwhile, everybody and their uncle is trying to get in touch with the, these parents to let them know that their daughter is alive, that she's safe, that she's well, but they really want to reunite them. And this goes on for years. Uh, they, the parents keep moving around various bits of Italy and they keep on thinking, maybe we should go back. Maybe it's, you know, too late now. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's been too long now. Maybe we should go. And they don't for a really long time. Then the spectre of war appears in this book. Um, you know, Lucy by this point is a, a sort of teenager and then a young woman. And she is looking around her life um, she's, you know, quite happy. She reads a lot. She has kind of created a, a very happy life for her based on all the books and all the things around her in this house. And she sort of becomes the woman of the house. She kind of lives this life. But war is coming. And in the process of war coming, obviously Italy um, with Mussolini becomes not a very safe place. Um, and so increasingly the, these parents are the ones who are trapped and they've been sort of running away in some ways from from problems but they run straight into new problems because now they're in Italy in a time where they have to think about how they can escape and they do sort of get around to, to Switzerland however before they this is a bit of a spoiler alert here I mean most of this has been so far but we do get them reunited but only one parent manages to make it back and there's this real unspokenness that happens between the parent who returns and Lucy because both of them have no idea what to say to each other. It's been such a long time. And the last time they saw Lucy, she was like six or something. And it's stunning. It's jaw droppingly beautiful how this is done. And again, the death of the other parent is handled in a sentence at the end of a chapter in the sweetest, most loving, but most heartbreaking way. Uh, most, did I say most lovest? Most loving uh, and most heartbreaking way. It's just gorgeous. And, um, this book just follows this really beautiful tone and narrative. The language is so playful, it's so interesting, it's so alive. Um, and we then sort of fast forward a bit more down Lucy's life um, and we end the book with her as an old woman. Um, and this old woman, Lucy, has is now interacting with a world of mobile phones, of um, technology, and she cannot keep up. And she's so fascinated by it. Um, and we um, sort of learn increasingly, you know, where she is um, and that she has moved to um, 
a sort of re retirement home slash sort of nursing home um, kind of thing. And it's just so beautifully done because we, you know, people around her are sort of trying to explain some of this technology to her. Um, and she finds it all quite bizarre, you know, she'll go out on a little walk and she'll see people with phones, uh, you know, next to their, their faces and she doesn't quite get how this could be a thing, um, how, you know, why are these people holding these little small radios to their ears as they're walking um, and talking to them. And that, it's interesting because that part almost didn't need to be there, you know, we didn't necessarily have to have this final bit of her talking about technology. But I find it so poignant that we did, because it's just gorgeous. Um, uh, this kind of woman looking back over her life. And again, as I have sort of said in a few videos before, I have such a soft spot for books that are about characters, often outcast characters, looking back over their lives, um, looking over family drama. Uh, and I'm getting a bit teary actually thinking about this book. And... Um, and I mean, Irish writing almost always does it for me as well. So <laughs> this is the kind of a bit of a, a sort of smorgasbord of everything I adore anyway. So I think I was kind of destined to like this, but it is so gorgeously done. Um, and I'm really excited to read Love and Summer that he was long listed for uh, with in, in 2009. Um, but those have been the four books um, that saw William Trevor get shortlisted, never won unfortunately, um, which seems like a shame, but um, four books that I just think are so gorgeous and it just makes me really want to check out pretty much everything he's written because there's something so alive and beautiful about his language. Um, it involves so many sort of colloquialisms, particularly quite Irish ones, um, but it also just has a rhythm and a and it's observant in how it looks at the world um, and how it processes trauma and grief and memory and um, family relationships and being an outcast or an outsider. Um, I just think it's stunning and I now totally see why he is such a beloved writer um, and why, you know, this Bob Hughes Lifetime Achievement Award was was duly granted to him because he's just a powerhouse of... of of writing seriously so i think i've discovered a new writer who well, a, a new favorite writer um and uh i'm really excited to check out more anyway if you've read anything by uh william uh, william trevor um whether that's anything i've spoken about here or anything else by him um i'd love to hear it uh and I'm always up for really good recommendations of Irish authors because I'm sort of noticing <laughs> a pattern of uh, increasingly I'll sort of fall in love with an author and then be like, oh, and they're Irish. OK, <laughs> there we go. This is very much like me as a teenager when like every band or like artist I got into happened to be Canadian. It just became a thing. <laughs> so uh, maybe this is my type, apparently, for, for writing. Um, and I'm still getting a little bit emotional thinking about Lucy Gould. But anyway, uh, I'm going to pause that there. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this um, and let me know some of your thoughts around William Trevor or, or other Irish authors. Uh, take care and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.